Welcome, everybody, to another night of garden hour. <laughs> we had a slight identity crisis earlier, but we're 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 back online. Welcome, glad to see everybody <laughs> post uh, East River derecho. I'm sure we'll be talking about that later this evening. So to start off tonight, we have I'll. I'll just, I just took over host. I got the, I got the Zoom power. It's gone to my head. I'm the host now. <laughs> but I am joined tonight by Dr. Christine Lang, Dr. John Ball, Laura Edwards, our state climatologist is going to be hopping on with us. And my name is Amanda Bachman. So welcome everybody. I believe we're going to kick things off with John, and we're just going to jump right into it since I know we've gotten started just a little bit late, and I know we've got a lot of content to cover. So I will turn it over to Dr. Ball, and I can see I can see your PowerPoints, the sort of you know back end view of it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Looks good. All right. Well. I'm hoping this all works and uh, thank you tonight. We did have a few technical difficulties and hopefully we resolve them. Um, uh, tonight, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of things, but kind of critical. First of all, where are we at in growing degree days? Uh, we're way behind still. Uh, no, we're behind still, not way behind. We actually caught up with that slightly warmer weather we've had. Uh, Aberdeen is still in the tundra of the north at 177. And things are just beginning to pop there, where if you take a look at Sioux Falls and Rapid City, they've really gained a lot of ground in the last couple of weeks. But we are so late. This is a picture of a Cornelian cherry, Cornus moss, which is one of my favorite shrubs. And you can't grow it up in Aberdeen in, in the tundra, but you can grow it in Brookings, where I took this picture, all the way over to Spearfish. Some beautiful examples there. It's one of our first shrubs to bloom in the spring, and it's just blooming now in Brookings. Uh, normally, this blooms about the first week of April. So it kind of shows you where we're at. But because it got warm all of a sudden, the seasons just crunched. I'm seeing plants and bloom together that I normally don't. I mean, we even have a couple of lilacs that buds are beginning to pop. So it seems like that long, cold spring then got compressed into a very brief warm period with a little rain. Uh, rain and it's kind of just throwing everything into bloom at once. So enjoy it while you can. You know, South Dakota, our springs may last one or two days. Uh, even the forsythias are in bloom at the same time, uh, which is kind of unusual. You can see here, they're already beginning to leaf out. And the uh, pears are starting to flower. Now, I noticed, in, and this is all in Brookings, of course, if you're down in Yankton, we're already ahead of this there, lilacs are in full bloom. But uh, for us, our lilacs are just starting, but the pears, which bloom a little bit earlier than the crab apples, are just gorgeous right now, just as a reminder, though. Uh, and this is, um, I think this is a prairie gem pear. By the way, a wonderful pear blooms when the leaves are coming out. But uh, unlike crab apples or apples, uh, a lot of these pear cultivars, the flowers smell like rotting fish. Uh, so be cautious to stick your nose in and take a deep breath. Uh, it may uh, disappoint you. Now, some are just a little bit musky, but I've rarely seen a pear that's, that's absolutely fragrant. So best plant it away from your patio is my recommendation. Well, as she mentioned, our storm. Uh, for those of you maybe watching us from West River, uh, you've heard about the storm, of course. It's, it was even made the national news. But if you're in eastern South Dakota, particularly um, along uh, Highway 81 East, um, you all know about it, particularly from about uh, Watertown down to uh, uh, a little south of Sioux Falls. That's where I've seen most of the damage. Seems like a little north of Brookings was kind of the epicenter where we saw most of it, but it was these very powerful straight line winds. So it ran across a very long area, uh, lasted for about 
two hours, but incredibly strong winds, thunderstorms that were embedded into it. And unfortunately, the loss of a lot of trees and of course, two lives, uh, which is far more critical than the loss of any trees or property. Uh, but now we're in that cleanup stage uh, after the storm. We started about eight o'clock that night and there's people working everywhere to pile up the debris. This was really what I've called spruce again, because about 80% of the trees that came down were spruce. And there's a good reason for that. Now, this is one on our campus that we dragged out into a parking lot to cut up. It didn't fall that far into the parking lot. And what I want you to notice is that root plate, it is shallow. Uh, spruce do not have deep roots at all. Um, and it's just this very shallow plate that goes out. And so it doesn't take a lot of wind to kick these things over. Uh, and at this time of year, they were the tree that of course had the largest canopies because of all the fine needles into it and, and a very dense canopy, shallow root system, and then add a hundred mile an hour wind with a dash of rain to moisten the soil. And they were falling left and right. Um, I think I've removed 50 uh, in the last uh, five days, along with probably about 20 uh, pines that came down and a smattering of deciduous trees as well. The deciduous trees that came down, as this one did on campus, was just an old rotted ash tree. And we have a lot of very old rotted ash trees, so we lost a lot of those. To me, losing the ash was just paying forward. Uh, they were going to be infested anyway by emerald ash where nobody was going to spend a dollar treating these trees. So this way we got rid of them faster. And as most of you know, I'm not a big fan of spruce. So the loss of spruce on our campus uh, was not a great loss to me at all. And we'll back plant with uh, Douglas fir and a number of other evergreens rather than continue to perpetuate the overplanting of Colorado spruce. Uh, there's an awful lot of spruce still standing. And if you take a look at around the base, your spruce, and you see all these cracks here, that means you have root damage there already. I've been getting calls from people saying, well, I'm seeing this mounding around my tree. That mounding is not a good sign. That means you've already got some root separation there. And while a tree like that may stand for weeks or months or possibly even a year, the damage is such that that is very susceptible for uh, falling at a future point. It's not going to take another 100 mile hour wind to knock this thing over. Uh, a 40 mile an hour wind in a wet day could do it. Uh, it could even happen on a dry day. So if you have a tree that looks like this after the storm, for those you were in the path of that very widespread storm, you might want to look at your evergreens, those that are still standing. And if you notice this, uh, particularly on the side where the winds came from. Um, you, note of caution, just take it out. Now, of course, the other question I've been getting is from all those people that really like their spruce, is they say, can we stand it back up? Well, to answer that properly, yes, you can. You get enough guy wires attached to about two thirds of the height of the tree and you get enough big equipment, you can stand these back up. But now it's going to be a Christmas tree because they've lost all their roots, as you can see, on the upslope here of the plate. And those roots that are exposed have now been drying in the uh, warm sun. So they've died back quite a ways. And you've bent the roots on the other side, or I should say the wind bent the roots on the other side. And so at this point, uh, you can stand them up, but the long-term survival is very poor. You're going to have to stake them because it's going to be years before they get enough of a root mass again to provide their own stability. And most likely in that time period, they're going to continue to decline. So within another three or four years, if they haven't fallen over yet, you'll be hoping they do. So just clean them up. Don't bother to try to write them again. It'll be a temporary fix. However, some of the small deciduous trees, uh, such as this plum uh, that just popped up, it's a small tree. It's not going to take much to write it. You are going to have to guy it at about two thirds its height. Three guys uh, set, you know, at about a uh, what sixty or so degree angle away from each other, 
and you're going to have to guy them for several years, they may recover. Now, again, they may still die as well or, or decline over the next couple of years. But if you have a favorite small deciduous tree and you really want to try to save it, you can stand it up. But do keep in mind, most likely here again in another three or four years, the plant will decline to the point where you're going to say, well, I'm going to take it down anyway. Or again, even with guy and it may fall over. So this might be just a time, a good opportunity to say, well, you know what, I'm going to replace these trees with something a little bit better and maybe better situated in your yard. Uh, a couple of other things going on, an Emerald Ash Borer update. Right now, they're in their pupa stage, right in the sapwood. In fact, they're beginning to turn color, as you can see this little guy is. Uh, as they start to darken, that means they're approaching the adult stage. Now, uh, I think they still got about two weeks before we start seeing the first emergence on these, because they have to darken quite a bit and really flush out to become an adult. And even as an adult, they'll sit underneath the bark for a few more days before emerging. So I think, think we're still on target for right after Memorial Day. June 1st is where I expect to see them. Now again, we'll always have a couple of pioneer beetles, if you will, that pop out before everybody else does. But really the, the main body of the flight will probably start about June 1st and will peak about three weeks later. Uh, so as typically we find, month of June is where we're going to have an awful lot of emerald ash borers flying. I do want to point out now, too, that if we take a look at where emerald ash borer has confirmed infestations, uh, we found them in Sioux Falls in 2018, of course, and that was probably there for maybe four years before we uh, discovered it. In 2020, we found an infestation in Canton, and that also looks like it had been there for at least four years. And if you go through Canton now, you'll find that there's many, many, many uh, standing infested trees that probably have about another year to go before they die. Sioux Falls has been doing an excellent job of taking trees down all along. But nevertheless, I can find ones that are pretty much near death from the infestation as well. We found a small infestation in 2020 in Worthing. That has not really spread that much yet. There's not as much ash, uh, for example, but it is beginning to uh, kill trees or decline in trees. Uh, now looked to be a relatively new infestation when we found it. And then this last weekend, I was able to confirm an infestation up by Crooks. Uh, that infestation looks at least two years old. Again, we never find the first infested tree. So we really have four regions or communities in which we have known infestations of emerald ash borer. Uh, again, a reminder, if you live in Minnehaha County or Lincoln County, and you might as well even consider Turner County, that you may want to start considering treating your trees if you not, have not done so already. Uh, because the likelihood is that your trees will be infested with the next couple of years if they're not already infested. So again, we're adding one more location to our confirmation list. By the way, this is how we found it. Very small flucking like this. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of blonding. The first year or two of a new infestation, the woodpeckers just haven't quite figured them out yet. So you're not going to find the entire bark of the tree uh, blonded. You're just going to find these small patches where the woodpeckers have pecked or drilled in there. And we pulled that back. And sure enough, there were the galleries of our emerald ash borer. And to confirm an infestation, I need more than this. I need to find one. And I was able to find pupae in this tree and a number of others as well in, in the area. So uh, we certainly do have a new infestation up in the uh, Crooks area. Uh, which is a reminder too for treatment time. Uh, we are coming into that. There's a variety of ways it can be treated. A reminder to everyone here that if you're not within 15 miles of an infestation or you're not in the counties that we have known infestations, it's premature to treat. So if you're up in Brookings or Aberdeen or heaven forbid, Rapid City, you really don't need to begin treating your trees yet. But if you're in those localities to which we have them, yes, please do so. And now treatments can begin. As the trees begin to leaf out, this is the time to have the tree companies come out 
and inject your trees. I do want to point out that if you really want to have successful treatments, this is not a do-it-yourself uh, project. You do want to hire a company who have better chemistry in order to treat your trees. So uh, now would be the time to call them because the, they're already leafing out and that'll help pull the chemical they inject into the tree up into it. Uh, the adults, as I mentioned, are going to begin emerging in late May or early June. This is a picture I took last year, obviously, of one coming out into the world. If you inject the trees in, uh, uh, in late May, June, you'll kill the adults as they start feeding on the leaves, even before they lay eggs. And you'll also kill the young larvae. So uh, treating them now, once the leaves start coming out, is really the ideal time to get the work done. Again, from late May and in, in through June is absolutely fine. You'll get the most bang for your buck. Uh, last two items that I do wanna mention, cause it's not all our storm and emerald ash borer. Boy, have I been getting a call on bright red maple leaves. Um, and maple will do this if they have a cold spring, which we certainly had, and we may have a cold week weekend, the leaves come out with a red. A lot of the anthocyanins, which are responsible for the red color in the fall, are present in these leaves. They believe they might protect the leaves from frost injury. So the pigments may actually have a function to them, but it is no cause for concern. Just enjoy the spring color, but not on these. I think uh, in the last two days, I must have had uh, 20 calls, emails, texts on arborvitaes that have discolored. And the common theme is they looked great until about two, to, two weeks ago, and then they've started browning. We've also had some reports and pictures sent in of spruce, particularly the dwarf Alberta spruce showing the same symptom patterns. And they'll say, well, it just happened. Well, you know what? The Christmas tree that we cut down last fall stuck in the house over Christmas and then put up in our backyard just for the heck of it. It didn't turn brown until two weeks ago and it didn't have roots at all. This is just winter desiccation injury. We had a dry fall uh, and uh, they went into it fairly dry unless people have been watering them. And so we ended up with a lot of damage. My recommendation is just wait a few more weeks uh, see what greens up. Most of this won't. Shear it out. See if you like the rest of the plant. Uh, take care of it this summer. If we do have a drought, I'll let Laura talk about that. Uh, and uh, hopefully it recovers. But again, this is always a good reminder that to prepare your trees for winter, you really need to be watering in August and September and early October. Don't give them a drink just before freeze up. That's a little late. So that's what I have to report uh, for this evening, and I will stop sharing and turn it back over to uh, Amanda. All right. We did have a question in the chat, um, or not the chat, in the Q&A for you. I posted a link to a resource, but uh, one of our participants wanted to, you to explain the base 50 with degree days. Oh, we were going to do that last week, and we couldn't. Um, again, that's really taking the high and low temperatures. And what we do is look at it as 50 degrees. And by taking that, it's the average, if you will, above 50, we accumulate the number of hours, if you will, degree days is what we call it, uh, that is above that threshold. Uh, January and February, we rarely had any days above 50 that we could start the communication. I think we had seven uh, growing degree days by uh, early March. But now that we're getting to time periods where the temperatures even at night are uh, staying close to 50, we've really been accumulating that. So it's a, it's a thing, it's a system we use and we use base 50. Uh, and I think Amanda would for bugs as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a means of looking at their development because it's tied very close to that. And uh, add anything you want to that, Amanda, but I think we frequently use it for insect development as well as plant development. Yeah, and it's kind of a way to sort of standardize the, like, way to standardize like development time from the start of the calendar year. And so for different insects, like I spent some time in grad school doing 
degree day modeling for pests of cucurbits. So trying to figure out, you know, how many degree days do they need before they start being active, before they mate, before they lay eggs. And you might run across some articles where they use a different base for the degree days, but the concept is the same. So it's just kind of a way to standardize that development measure that we use. You know what, and that's a good point, uh, Amanda, that, yeah, sometimes I've seen base 65 and, mm -hmm. and so on, and they're used for different things. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the bug people and the plant people uh, use base 50s. That seems to work out the best for our area for insect and plant development. Yep. Yeah, so that's the, that's the crash course in degree days for everybody. <laughs> Next up, we have Laura Edwards. She is our state climatologist based in the Aberdeen Regional Center. And for those of you watching along at home, feel free if you've got any questions to throw those into the Q&A box and we will either type answers. So if it's something for John, we can type an answer while Laura's talking or I will make sure to ask Laura before her segment is over. So I'll turn it over to Laura Edwards. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, yeah, about base 50, you know, corn is one of those things we use base 50 also um, because corn doesn't germinate until 50 degrees, um, at least soil temperature, but, you know, we use air temperature as kind of an approximation. Um, when we look at wheat, we look at 40 degrees, base 40, because that's when wheat germinates. So it's kind of dependent too on the, on the plant or the insect on when it starts being active. Um, we use that as a base temperature too. So. Um, on the Mesonet website, I'll talk about the Mesonet in a little bit. Um, we do have a growing degree day calculator um, that you can use for any weather station um, that's live um, online um, from the Mesonet network. So there's an automatic way to calculate those too. So um, I kind of have more information than I wanted <laughs> time to share with you. So I'm gonna zip right through it. The first um, biggest news of the week has been the derecho. Um, people are calling it a windstorm, that's true. Um, but a derecho is really a whole cluster of uh, severe thunderstorms that kind of move together in one big line. And in this case, it was over 400 miles long, um, about 60 miles wide by the time um, it moved from west to east. So a really huge area from Nebraska to Minnesota. Um, and so I have a series of webcam pictures from our Brookings weather station there on campus. Um, so you, you can see this is looking towards the Southwest. It looks like right towards campus. You can see the football stadium there in the bottom right. Um, so I have a picture, each one of these pictures is one minute apart. Um, and I think I have five of them. So um, instead of doing a video or an animated thing, I thought it'd be easier to just do still pictures on the Zoom. So um, this was taken, um, I need to just close my, uh, 5.23 p.m. You can see the snapshot or the timestamp on the top right there. So 5.23 p.m. Um, at 5.24, it looked like this. And you see that big dust cloud ahead of it. Um, that was called a haboob. Um, more commonly seen in the southwestern states in the desert environment, but we saw a lot of soil, a lot of uh, dirt pick up on that leading edge of the storm. Um, this was 525, one more minute later, and you see it coming 526, and it's right on top of us. And then 527, it was just overcoming um, the station. You just see the tower, and then and then it was night uh, for a few minutes. So very fast moving storm, um, moved about 60 to 70 miles an hour um, as it moved across. Wind speeds peaked out at 107 miles an hour. I believe that was measured down in Tripp County, um, but we saw a lot of wind measurements, um, wind reports in that 60 to 70 plus uh, mile per hour range. So. Um, I just wrote an article today um, kind of explaining what a derecho is. Um, we have, we do see these in South Dakota. This is a very large one um, by our standards. Last saw one in June of 2020, um, more in the central part of the state. Um, but if you want to look for more information, I have an article that's going to be coming out on the website about what a derecho is and, and some of those pictures that I shared. So. 
Um, that was the big news from last week. Oh, and, and also there were three tornadoes associated with that, um, as can happen um, with severe thunderstorms as well. So um, not to um, discount any of the damage um, and, and any of the, the weather there, um, but to move on to some other topics, I also have been getting a lot of questions about, holy smokes, it's really windy out there. <laughs> and yeah, it has been windy out there. Um, this is um, a, a bit of information that the Aberdeen National Weather Service wrote up last week and posted on their website. I'm not sure if it's a headline story, but if you go um, to their blog um, of, their, of their stories, you can still see it there. Uh, wind data is notoriously difficult uh, to, to compile and pull together. Um, part of the problem is that wind measurements are taken at different heights with different sensors at different locations. You know, the airports are kind of all the same, but then our mesonet stations measure it differently. Um, some people take a wind gust for like a one second peak and some people do a wind gust for like a three second or five second peak. You know, there's just different measurements all over. But in general, Aberdeen uh, Weather Service Office pulled together a couple of airports, and I'm just pulling two examples here. They did like five. Um, Look like at average wind speed for the month of April. Um, and you see the green line, green bar on the far right, that's 2022. Um, so in the past 20 some years, about 25 years, the windiest of average wind speed anyway, highest average wind speed in April, um, at least 25 years. Um, the area shaded in gray, again, is when they had kind of different instrumentation and, and different measurement techniques, so a little bit different there. Um, you can look at Pier there in the central part of the state, similar kind of story, uh, highest average wind speed in about 20, in over 20 years, um, according to their records. So yeah, this certainly has contributed to um, drought conditions, uh, at least in the month of April, it's kind of changed recently. Um, you know, we, and um, loss of soil or movement of soil, um, especially on croplands and farmlands, that kind of thing. And this dried our landscape out a little bit, um, especially in the central and west. So, um, yep, it has been windy <laughs> and it's not just your imagination. Um, temperature, uh, John, Dr. Ball alluded to this, that we've been cooler than average. I just grabbed a map looking at the last 30 days, last month of temperatures as compared to average or normal. Um, so you can see really most of the state, anything in the green, blue, purple colors has been cooler than average for the last uh, month last 30 days, you can see the scale down there. The further north you get, the colder it's been compared to average. Uh, in the south, a little closer towards um, average for this time, of, for the last 30 days, um, and a couple isolated areas that were warmer um, down there. So, um, but really cooler than average has been the story, with the exception of a little bit warmer temperatures lately. So that brings us looking at frost dates. Um, and we updated these maps um, just this spring. Um, they're on the Mesonet web page. I have a, a section for climatologists, but you can look at that link down there, um, climate.sustate.edu slash tools slash frost. And the spring maps are updated. We're still working, we'll be working on the fall ones here in a little while. Um, but we got the spring dates. These are using the new uh, climate normals and, or new climate um, averages from NOAA that were released um, within the last year. So this is looking at data from 1990 to 2020, that 30 year period. So here the 50 percentile is the median date or kind of the typical date that we'd see uh, the last 32 degree frost. We'd see it on or before these dates. So for most of us, you know, it's, it's sometime in early May in the purple colors. Um, when you get to yellow, it's May 10th to 12th and further west um, even later. So, you know, this would be their typical frost date. So keeping that in mind, um, take a look at where you are. And the next one, here, this is what we would call a very late frost date, um, would be this day or 
on these dates or later. So you're looking at, um, you know, the purples are May 10th to 21st, something like that, which is about this week, last week and this week. The yellows you're looking at, you know, May 22nd, 25th, and then the greens even later. So this is what we, we consider a very late frost. Um, and looking ahead at the forecast, I don't know how many of you peaked at Saturday and Sunday yet, um, but we're looking at a uh, potential for um, near freezing conditions um, coming up here on the weekend um, with temperatures dropping about 20 degrees from what they were yesterday. I have a forecast map of that, but I must have put it out of order. So I'll get back to that <laughs> a little bit. Um, but we're looking at pretty late frost. Um, you know, John showed some pictures of trees and that kind of thing. I live um, just outside Aberdeen, and as I was working in the garden this weekend, the apple trees were just just budding out. Um, lilacs, they're just barely turning green. Um, so we are we are certainly slow up here um, as far as those things go. Um, precipitation, I showed some temperature things. Precipitation, um, I know this is kind of a fuzzy map because it uses radar data, so it's kind of blocky, but hopefully you can find the county lines in there. Um, this is looking at the last 30 days and how wet or dry we've been compared to average. So as a percent of normal or percent of average, um, again, blues and purples are wetter than average, yellows um, are drier than average. So you see there's some really um, tight gradients or short distances between areas that have been really wet and really dry. Certainly the north central part of the state has really turned wet um, after experiencing, you know, some pretty severe drought conditions last year and over the early summer, early spring, I'm sorry. But uh, west central and that far southeast, we're still looking at um, continuing dry conditions. Haven't caught much rain in those areas just yet. Um, so I think we're in a little better situation. We're looking at the drought monitor and we kind of have a tale of two South Dakotas going on right now where we have exceptionally wet areas in the Northeast. You know, a lot of farms are looking at prevent plant situations where they just can't get out there. It's really too wet to the West where it's really too dry and their grasses are really short, um, partly due to cool temperatures, but also there's really not much water out there in the landscape. Um, and creeks and rivers and um, stock dams and all that kind of thing. So this is a close-up of South Dakota right now as of last week, um, just under 68% of the state in some level of drought. Um, to give you some perspective, that red color D3 um, is something like three to five times in a century kind of drought um, for this time of year on this map that's produced every week. So. Um, really quite severe drought conditions out there uh, in the western part of the state. And uh, this just again kind of emphasizes, you know, the green areas have improved on the drought monitor um, over the last month and the yellow area, yellow to orange areas have worsened. So we've seen again quite a mixed bag with that area in the northeast really getting much wetter, um, which I think is good news for, for a lot of us. Um, but we still have areas that are holding dry. Um, so I'm trying to acknowledge both, both sides of the coin here um, with the conditions going on. Oh, here's the, here's the um, minimum temperature maps. I must have slid um, in a different place here, but looking at low temperatures Saturday and Sunday mornings. Um, on the left there, Saturday morning low, um, Sunday morning low there on the right. So. You know, even if the forecast low is 35, 34 degrees, um, you know, those low spots still can see a light frost, uh, maybe a short, short time um, below freezing, you know. So I would certainly cover those more sensitive um, plants in your yard and garden if you want to save them, flowers, you know, some of the vegetables, um, if you have them already out there. Um, you know, they, they can be a little more sensitive, even just to a, what I would call a light frost, where it just barely dips to 32. Again, we're not gonna see a long duration, um, you know, not many hours at those cold temperatures, but certainly we'll see some susceptibility out there um, 
with these with these cool temperatures two nights two nights in a row and I'm sure uh, Christine can address that a little bit more too um, looking ahead next seven days out west north central not looking like much precipitation at all this is seven day total precipitation so after you know uh, Thursday passes through I know some parts of the east might see some rain on Thursday um, really generally light um, amounts for the rest of the next seven days beyond that. So we're looking at, you know, those greens are less than a half an inch, less than a quarter of an inch for most of us. So really not much. Um, but this time of year, we're looking at what climatology is about three quarters of an inch a week. You know, so we're getting to about the wettest time of year, which is in June. So, um, you know, we should be, um, and not should be, but typically we see, you know, three quarters of an inch of rain a week. So um, this is a little bit light for the next week. Beyond that, uh, we do see kind of a continuation of temperatures staying below average, at least in the northern part of the state. This is one to two weeks out. So this is that week starting May 25th to 31st, that last week of May. Um, looking like, you know, the northern part of the state uh, leaning towards colder temperatures and also wetter conditions in that time frame. Um, so if you're in the northeast you might, <laughs> might see both of those things again. Um, and I know we have seen improvements in the drought conditions in the northwest. Um, but yeah temperatures those cooler temperatures will keep things slow from developing slow growing um, in your yards and gardens um, if you're in that area. As we look ahead towards the summer, um, just one caveat that these maps here, these monthly seasonal maps will be updated on Thursday morning. So this information is a little bit stale, um, but I think the general message is probably still gonna be there when I was looking at the models, climate models uh, earlier today, um, still leaning towards warmer than average temperatures for the, for the mo part of the summer. Um, I don't know that June will start out warm, but it looks like July, August, um, later June and July and August will be leaning towards warmer than average in, in most of South Dakota. I think that far northern part of the country like Montana, North Dakota might not be so warm. But the other thing too, we do see a leaning towards drier than average conditions uh, in that same time in that June, July and August timeframe. So, what does this mean for you? Could mean more hand watering, more irrigation, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if it's drier, typically we see less disease unless you're watering pretty heavy. Um, maybe some different in insect pressure. Um, we tend to see more grasshoppers. Certainly grasshoppers are an issue when they um, move out of the dry areas and they're looking for something green and your garden looks really attractive. Um, you know, we can see those kinds of issues too. So um, keep in mind for that, especially if you're in the drought area um, for some of those insects to come in. Um, I'm sure as we go through through the season, um, all of the SDSU folks will be addressing, you know, kind of the emerging issues as we see them. Um, but look ahead towards warmer and drier conditions potentially in that midsummer. Hopefully we can catch up on some of those growing degree days and get, get our plants um, moving ahead a little faster. As we look towards kind of harvest season at the end of the summer, early and into the fall, um, not so likely uh, to be warmer necessarily, um, potentially drier in the southwestern part of the state. If you're in that area, that'd be kind of south of Rapid, um, you know, and west of, you know, Todd County, roughly speaking. Um, but, you know, we'll see what they say on Thursday. Again, this information is a little bit stale. Um, but really at heart of the summer is where I see the warm and dry conditions. Um, Mesonet, quick. Um, we have this whole group of weather stations. Um, everything in red squares or rectangles are going to get upgraded equipment this year. The yellow dots are the projected new locations to go in the ground this year. So look for um, a handful of new stations, of about 16 total, either between the upgrades or the new stations. So quite a lot in the central and western part of the state, but we've got a couple on the east too, um, if you're in that in that area. Um, we've got temperature, pressure, um, precipitation. In the winter, we have snow depths. Um, 
We also have soil temperature and moisture, if you're interested in looking at that. Um, one of the cool things about that is looking at soil temperature. Um, up here in Aberdeen, it is prime time for moral mushrooms and wild asparagus. We just found the wild asparagus last night at our, at our place in the trees. Um, it's perfect for picking. Um, I know some people found some morals um, over the weekend as well. So soil temperature is one of those things that um, helps indicate when those are ready to come up and ready to go on the hunt for those. Um, so we use this for a ton of different things and, and hopefully you can check it out too um, if you're interested in watching the weather out there. Um, with that, sorry I talked really quick, but um, kind of a lot going on <laughs> this week and this season as um, we're getting kind of in the prime gardening season. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. I don't see anything in the Q&A right now, but hang on, maybe some stuff will trickle in. But in the meantime, we will move on to Dr. Christine Lang, who's going to think give us some updates on what was happening in, in Brookings this past week and maybe how, how her garden fared. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, my photos aren't as cool as Laura's were, but to be fair, I took this one myself right before I uh, told my husband, perhaps it's time for us to head into the bathroom with the pets. So um, we rode out the storm from a second story balcony in Brookings. We were grateful there wasn't a tornado, but you definitely could see that dust coming. And I had been given a heads up that this was coming our way after visiting with um, one of the assistant farm managers at our um, SDSU farm in Beersford, he had warned me that um, things were not looking good. So one of the first things I'll share that's storm related is we really had a tale of two high tunnels and I've, um, my heart definitely goes out to producers who lost, um, lost high tunnels or plastic or structures. Um, Definitely a tough time of the season for that loss as we're, you know, still dealing with cold temperatures and the whole point of high tunnels is to have that cold protection. Um, interestingly, we were working on recovering a small high tunnel. This one's about, um, let's see, like 20, 15 to 20 by 45. It's a smaller high tunnel at the Southeast Farm. And that's what's pictured here. We had just put new plastic sidewalls on this structure and put up the doors and redone the end walls. So this had new plastic that hadn't been degraded by the sun and was still, you know, pliable versus brittle and was plastic that was rated for, you know, UV protection as well. Um, and a tip that we had gotten from a, a local farmer here in South Dakota was um, instead of rope, to hold the sides so that they don't blow out and flap. We actually use this seat belt type material as strapping. And so when the winds hit at the Southeast farm, which it was a little bit, um, they hadn't picked up as heavily down there. This high tunnel, I was very surprised to learn actually held. One door panel fell out um, in the wind just from, I think, you know, flapping back and forth. But all told, um, this, one, this one did really, really well. And again, smaller structure probably stopped less wind. So there were some things in this favor, in, in its favor. And the posts on this tunnel were anchored quite well into the ground. Um, some high tunnel structures did not do so well. So movable high tunnels, this, was, this is a photo of our high tunnel here on campus. Unfortunately, that one was a total loss. Um, with a movable high tunnel, they often sit on tracks or rails and can be moved from spot to spot. So you can rotate crops or start early season lettuce and then move the high tunnel off of it and let that lettuce grow outdoors as it gets warmer. So these are a really great tool. Um, but unfortunately, the wind caught that one, ripped the anchors out of the ground because we had soft soils after the rains, and, and this one did not fare so well. Um, and I have heard some reports of people losing portions of plastic and, and some that went relatively unscathed. Um, if you're interested in more information about um, high tunnel storm protection and some routine maintenance, our neighbors over in Iowa dealt with derecho damage on high tunnels in August of 2020. And they did several rebuilds and took a lot of photos and used that as a teaching tool. Um, so if you go to the link provided here, 
that, um, that's a webinar that talks about preventing storm damage and trying to protect and brace for extra wind. And again, it's very difficult for a high tunnel or a small greenhouse in your home or on your farm to stand up to a derecho, but there are some things you can do to try to protect to against some of these higher wind events um, in terms of bracing and how what kind of materials they're using for covers. So, so there's hope. Um, some other things to think about, you know, we don't have a lot of plants in the ground yet from the, the vegetable and the flower garden standpoint. Those young herbaceous plants, um, I, I was pleasantly surprised that the plants on my second story balcony weathered the storm really quite well. Um, they were all still standing. <laughs> um, some things I noticed, and I visited with Dr. Burroughs about this as well, is you know, we did see a lot of debris. So, you know, in that high tunnel, we're not quite sure how it got, what crevice it blew into, but there was a lot of corn stalks from neighboring fields and that just needed to be swept out. Um, I didn't take a picture post storm, but I had a whole bed of newly germinated arugula. It was looking beautiful and great. And I very carefully with gloves um, picked fiberglass debris out of that because um, somewhere south of us, unfortunately, a, a building had blown apart and there was a lot of fiberglass. So, um, and, and a lot of dust, you know, we saw a lot of dust, we saw a lot of debris. So early in the season, you know, if you had you know, chard or arugula or things like that, that you were interested in, in consuming, just giving that an extra rinse to remove that dust and making sure you're getting that fiberglass and some of those other materials out there so that you're not ingesting that is, is the advice we have for you right now. And again, I think the saving grace is a lot of us have been delayed in our planting, so we didn't have as much of a mess to deal with. Um, and sticking with the theme of cold weather, these are some photos I actually received today and um, visited with this homeowner. And these were some of those um, large dragon leaf type, those whopper begonias that were planted in their garden several weeks ago. Um, and then they had a few plants that were planted in the garden just last week and saw a lot of browning, a lot of colored you and even the new growth was still showing browning and um, my, my first hunch was cold and thankfully Connie Tandy in our plant diagnostic clinic confirmed that suspicion as well that we as of right now really think this was freeze damage. Um, begonias don't like to sit in the, that really cold soil and the air temperatures have still just been too cool especially as we dip into some colder nights. Um, so the take home lesson here with most of our annual flowers and a lot of our favorite vegetables, such as our tomatoes and peppers, anything that's in the cucurbit family. So your cucumbers and your melons, um, keep, keep them indoors. If you haven't put them out yet, um, please don't just hang in onto them in the garage for the next week without any light, because you're going to have really unhappy, really stretched and thin plants. So still, you know, make sure you're watering them, getting them sunlight by day, but bringing them in in the evening because um, we're still seeing damage from the cold. And that's, that's gonna be the case again this weekend. So watch the weather. Um, this is an example of, you know, on a, on a larger scale farm, you might have something like a, an Agrabond row cover that you're putting over your plants. But I show this to just give you some ideas. You know, if you've got big blankets, old bed sheets, large tarps, pieces of plastic. Again, with all of these things, um, they're only gonna be useful if they um, are actually staying on the plants. So if you have sandbags or some you know, paver bricks, things that you can help hold that down. Now, if you're using plastic material or tarps, um, all those points of contact, if your tomato leaves are touching that tarp or that plastic, um, could still have cold damage. So maybe draping those tarps over some buckets and getting a pocket of air around the plants and then securing it around the base, or even just throwing two by fours around that frame to help seal in that, that slightly warmer air. You'll have a little bit of warmth from the soil as well. Um, to just create more thermal mass to protect that plant material. And, and some of our plants, even, you know, as we saw with our, our begonia, it doesn't have to be freezing for us to see damage. Um, basil is another really great example of this. You get below 50 degrees and basil starts to brown. Um, I have some basil in my garden. I'm probably going to leave it uncovered so that I can 
have some photos for next week to show you an example of that. Um, so I want your plants to look much more gorgeous than my examples by the end of this week. Um, and last but not least, I want to let everyone know that um, the tulips at McCrory are gorgeous. They survived. They're, the McCrory crew is working really hard to clean up the gardens. They are open again to the public. And again, that's thanks entirely to their staff and as well as Dr. Ball has been assisting with tree cleanup and his expertise. So thank you to everyone who's been assisting McCrory Gardens. And um, Hopefully you got the word that we didn't have Garden Discovery Festival last Sunday. So we're gonna, we're gonna try again and we're gonna see you there this Sunday, May 22nd. And we're gonna have the same slate of speakers, myself, Dr. Ball, Cindy Jungman. There's gonna be garden tours with Sydney Trio and we'll have exhibitors as well as the native plant and the master gardener plant sale. So everything we were gonna do last week, we, we really look forward to seeing you on the 22nd. And with that, I'm gonna, out the if there are any questions for me Amanda otherwise I think we'll turn it over to you <laughs> all right yeah nothing in the Q&A um I am going to go ahead and share one of my screens there we go cool so I had a homework assignment from last week uh, <laughs> about what good or lost and uh social media delivered for me <laughs> So many of my friends have sent me the this image because, um, <laughs> yes, did a wasp write this? Probably. Let me show some pictures of wasps from my backyard. So wasps are can be really great. They are predators as adults. They will actually catch things like caterpillars and use those to, uh, you know, to feed their young, to provision their nests. Um, I have a colony of European paper wasps that hangs out at my house behind the shutters every single year. You can also find the wasps will be visiting flowers, so they can be pollinators as well. They're not as fuzzy as bees, so they maybe aren't as efficient at moving pollen from flower to flower, but they are still um, moving pollen around. So they do provide that ecosystem service as well. And I think, as I mentioned last week, you know, this is the time of year that if you notice a social wasp, so something like the European paper wasps, yellow jackets, if you notice them building a nest or, you know, sort of congregating in an area that's going to be high traffic or that's going to get, you know, disturbed a lot, you know, like your mailbox, this is the time of year to be doing that control and knocking those nests down and, you know, or spraying, you know, treating those adults so that they don't keep building a nest. If you wait until later in the summer, you're going to have a nest that's at its maximum capacity, full of workers, full of, you know, daughters that are going to defend the nest. And so that's when it can get kind of dangerous. Obviously, if you're somebody that has you know an anaphylactic reaction to a bee or a wasp sting? Make sure you've got your EpiPen handy, and you know maybe call in somebody else to you know handle these critters. But they are a valuable part of the ecosystem. They tend to not be aggressive as long as you are not right near their nest, and also that you don't have something that they want. Um, yellow jackets get in trouble because they'll come for soda cans and they'll crawl in the soda can and you don't see because the can is opaque. So it's important to, you know, have clear containers or containers that have a lid and a straw that an insect can't get into, you know, during summer barbecue. So there are some things that you can do to mitigate your risk there. They will also sometimes come uh, to protein sources. So like burgers, you know, hot dogs, whatever, because, you know, like a caterpillar, they're looking for that protein source for their young. So you can also, you know, kind of have a decoy, you know, decoy hot dog for the wasps to kind of keep them away. But wasps are cool. I love them. They provide a nice uh, security service for me in my backyard. Most people don't mess with me when they see a bunch of uh, European paper wasps hanging out. So wasps are, wasps are good. You can, you can let them live. I did want to give folks a little bit of an update on grasshoppers. I know we had a lot of questions last year, especially from gardeners about what to do about grasshoppers. And I was out at Oahe downstream last week planting flowers and you know that forecast for the cold temperatures. It's like, oh man, those kids put all those annuals in the ground. We will see how they do this weekend. <laughs> but I found my first little tiny baby uh, two-striped grasshopper. So the grasshoppers have hatched here in central South Dakota. As long as things are green and lush, you really won't notice a ton of damage from them. But where we get in trouble is as these get larger 
And if we, you know, end up in a drought situation that gets a little bit more severe and your garden is the only thing green, that is what they will eat. So I'm sure we'll talk about some grasshoppers later in the garden hour season. And I know we've got some resource up, resources up already from last year on our extension website, but grasshoppers are out. If you've got, you know, chickens or birds in your yard, they are a great food source. And then just a cool little scarab beetle that I found uh, last week digging in the dirt with the kids. I in, clearly enjoy harassing beetles. They're easy when they're in the soil, but you can see on the underside kind of the, the, the little bit of fuzziness on the thorax and just how like all the little legs like fit in. So I like to throw up some pictures of cool insects that people might not think are sort of neat to look at. And for those of you who are in the Pier or Central South Dakota area, I will be doing Science on Tap here in town on Friday, May 20th. So this Friday, um, 5.30 p.m. at the St. Charles. So we'll be in the back event room. I've got some Madagascar hissing cockroaches. I have some insect treats. So things made with uh, cricket flour and uh, cricket protein powder. So that should be a super fun event. I'm really looking forward to it. So if you're in the area, please uh, come hang out on Friday with us for Science on Tap hosted by the Discovery Center. So with that, we've got one question in the chat about how to source a Nanking cherry plant. I don't know if there's gonna be any at the plant sale or if anyone has any hot tips on where to find one of those. I don't think they're gonna be at the plant sale and I'm gonna punt that one to John. <laughs> <laughs> You know, those are, they're hard to find, particularly the cultivars that are out there. But if you give me a week, I'll take a look at some of the sources I have for unusual plants. I mean, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the fact somebody wants to grow them and I'll see if I can find you a couple of the cultivars, but that'll be on next week's episode. All right. And we are right at the eight o'clock hour. So we we got through a ton of content this evening. The recording will be up on the YouTube channel and we will be back here same time next week, 7 p.m. for another edition of Garden Hour. So I wanna thank our panelists, Dr. Christine Lang, Dr. John Ball and Laura Edwards, our state climatologist. And we will see you next Tuesday. <laughs>